I'm so excited. Oh my God. <laughs> Same here. As I see the number of participants go up, I'm really excited to try this um, this little activity to see where everybody's from. It could be so cool. Oh yeah, getting there, eh? Quite a few of us. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is so good. I'm so thankful to be here. And we are thankful you are here. Yes. Okay. Okay, so I think I'm going to get started. So hello everyone. Uh, my name is Grace Suva from RNAO. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar titled Connecting Culture, Land and Wellness to Indigenous Youth. And this webinar is hosted by the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario, or RNAO, in partnership with Anishinaabe Aski Nation, the Chiefs of Ontario, the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health, the Canadian Indigenous Nurses Association, and the Ontario First Nation Young People's Council. We recognize that our work and the work of our members takes place on traditional Indigenous territories across Ontario. And we also wish to acknowledge that the office of the RNAO is located on the traditional Indigenous territory of the Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and most recently, the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We also recognize that the participants on today's webinar are located in other traditional lands across Ontario. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this territory. By personally making a land acknowledgement, you are taking part in an act of reconciliation, honoring the land and Indigenous heritage, which dates back to over 10,000 years. I would like to introduce you to Gahan Dagwas, Diane Longboat. She is a member of the Turtle Clan, Mohawk Nation at Six Nations Grand River Territory, Canada. She is a ceremonial leader, traditional teacher and healer. And since 2013, she has served as elder for the Center for Addiction and Mental Health and became the senior project manager guiding directions implementation, which is the CAMH strategy to improve practices and partnerships with First Nations, Inuit and Métis. She led the development of the ceremony grounds for CAMH to establish the Sweat Lodge, Sacred Fire, and Medicine Gardens. She is the founder of the Soul of the Mother, a healing lodge on the shores of the Grand River Six Nations, Grand River Territory, and the founder of First Nations House at the University of Toronto. And we have the pleasure of her to provide us with a traditional opening. So I pass it now on to you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Grace. What a beautiful day to be together. <clears throat> my name is Gahandagwas, it means she's picking sweetgrass, and my family is the clan of the turtle, and I'm Ganyangehaga, I'm Mohawk, from Six Nations in the Grand River Territory. Sego skano, sego guego, Gahandagwas, yunyats. So grateful to Sungwe Diso, our creator, for giving us this beautiful day. It's snowing here, <clears throat> and I'm so happy every time it snows. I love the white thunderbirds and I love the medicine that they're giving us for this time period, especially in the springtime. I have some sage here that I, I want to hold up and show to you because I think, you know, even though we're at great distances, this medicine joins us together in our hearts and our minds. And <clears throat> I also want you to know that I have some Iyonkweyongwe here, some sacred tobacco that we grow in our gardens at Six Nations. The seeds from this tobacco come from the spirit world. We say we come from the stars and we say <clears throat> that our home is in that Pleiades constellation, the seven sisters. And so when we make this offering of tobacco, we're acknowledging the sky world where we originated and we're acknowledging that we're human now we're walking the earth and we have duties and responsibilities to fulfill here, not just to each other, but to the natural world. And so our people were given the Ohurum Goliwurekwa, which is the words that come before all others. Those words are, are given before important gatherings, before times when we're going to share something that is going to be um, a ceremony, it could be a feast, it could be a very important gathering in the community. 
And in the case that we have here today, we have important words that are going to be shared from generations back. And we're looking towards the generations of the unborn. And we're trying our best to learn and to incorporate all of these things into the way of life of our people and into the way of life of um, all those who are allies sharing this land with us. You have also a duty and responsibility to take care of the land. We are the Ngwe Ngwe people, the original people here. And these ceremonies help us to understand the sacredness of the land, the sacredness of the relationship we have with one another. And so I want to offer a very short version of that Ohodom Gullywood Equa. And always with the caveat that it is our faith keepers who sing this in the language. They stand for 45 minutes, sometimes an hour, to give this blessing on all of creation and all, all of humanity. And so in my way, I, I wake up in the morning and at sunrise offer these words. So this version that I give to you today is a is a small version of that. So grateful to you, Sangwe Edison, for such a beautiful day, for the gift of life for one more day, to do our best work to help all of our relatives that are in the human family here on the earth. We are mindful that there's many faith traditions and cultures and languages and ways of being on the earth, that we have a very rich human family filled with diversity and with so much to learn from one another that it makes our life here truly blessed. We give thanks this day for all of the human family that is upon the earth. We give thanks also for the great vision that you had in visiting the most magnificent places in the universe and gathering dust and pollen from those places, swirling them together to form our mother, the earth. And today we honor that mineral life that is underneath our feet. We honor all of those beautiful waters that are upon the earth, the life-giving waters, for there is no life without water. And so we have fresh waters and salt waters, rain waters and birth waters. And today in our area, we're so blessed because we have the last, one of the last visits of the white thunderbirds bringing us snow and ice to bring us our final medicine for the season. We give thanks and honor that there are plants that are upon the earth that are the oldest form of life. Those plants have been here for millions of years and we are made from this soil and from these plants. We give thanks this day <clears throat> for the medicine plants that we'll be talking about in this webinar for the food sustainers, the corn, the beans, and the squash, the three sisters, for all of the standing tree people, also medicines for us, and also having the responsibility to heat our homes and keep us warm in the winter, and also to build our homes. We give thanks and honor to all of those beings that are in the plant world. He is today. We love you, and we honor you, and we ask you to stand with us during this time where we share many things together. We also honor all the living beings that are the flyers, the ones that stayed here all winter with us and the ones that have returned, singing their beautiful songs to us and lifting up our spirits. We honor and give thanks to all the beings that are alive in the waters. Those great waters that are upon the earth have the whales that hold the wisdom of creation and the grandmother turtle holding up the earth upon her back. We honor and give thanks to all of the animal life that is here. Some of them are food sustainers also for us and we, we honor them for the gift of life to feed our children and our families. We honor them as brothers and sisters in this great council of creation. Around us are unseen forces, four grandfather winds that are refreshing and cleansing mother earth and the thunder beings that are coming here at this time, both in the form of rain and in the form of snow and ice. We are grateful for all of those four sacred beings that the creator has in place, watching over humanity, helping us to maintain our pathways, 
Sometimes we as weak and, and ego-filled human beings forget. And so those four sacred beings will remind us in dreams and in visions that we have a sacred path to walk as a human family in, a, in the spirit of that great peace with one another and with the natural world. We give thanks this day for the stars that represent our ancestors, for the grandmother moon who is leading all the female life, for our grandfather, the sun, whose walk across the sky each day is never failing to bring light to the world and to restore us every single day to give us a new energetic walk in life. We honor <clears throat> all of the ancestors that have walked the earth before us and now are beings in the sky world. We thank you for the dreams and visions and teachings and guidance that you provide for us. We also honor and uplift all of those spiritual beings that assisted the creator with the process of creation. They continue to be messengers to us for healing and for sacred guidance. And so it is with all humility that the creator has given us this the words that come before all others spoken before important events. And even the creator has placed himself last and <clears throat> is so humble in the way that the world was created in the great abundance and the love that is here for us as human family. We are only asked to be grateful for everything that's here. So this day we give thanks and we ask some way to wrap your arms around the young people who are here with us today. Rachel and Quinn and our speaker, Joseph. These young people have been prayed for for thousands of years that they would be born to us at a time when we need them the most. So we are so grateful today that they stand in the, in the medicine and in the culture and in the language and in the nations of their people, and they make us proud. So this day we, we say now to you, Creator, for listening to our prayers and to sending us a new generation of leaders and healers and teachers and visionaries and prophets. So with these words, we give thanks that we have this opportunity to be together today. And I thank you for your kind and your respectful attention. Nyawe. Miigwech. Miigwech. And thank you very much, Diane, for that beautiful traditional opening and for uh, reminding us to honor and to be grateful for what we have. So thank you. Now, I just like to be able to um, reiterate what the webinar's objectives are for today. And it's to be able to facilitate a knowledge exchange between the indigenous youth and healthcare providers in regard to four objectives. One is to highlight the importance of language and what language says about well-being. Two, how culture helps to maintain well-being. Three, how the vision of the vision of healthy Indigenous youth, and four, the role of the healthcare provider in supporting Indigenous youth. So, before I pass it along to the other members of the planning committee and the speakers for today, just want to cover a few housekeeping items. First off, if you could please turn off your microphones and cameras, that would be really appreciated. Uh, we do don't have the Q and A, but we do have the chat box, and there you could put in your questions and. Uh, the two moderators, Quinn and Rachel, will uh, will will um, sift through them, and we'll definitely be able to get to as many questions as we can for you today. Just to let you know, also that if you have any technical questions, you could also use a chat, and if you have any comments or comments that you'd like to share about the webinar, please feel free to share them in the chat box as well. We'd like this to be a forum wherein we interact with each other. Also wanted to know that today's webinar is going to be recorded and it's going to be archived on the Arneo website. So if any time you want to be able to share this webinar with your colleagues, with your friends or with a family, please feel free to be able to do so. And I also wanted to let you know that um, this webinar is one of a three-part webinar series. This is webinar number two, and it has been accredited by the Indigenous Certification Board of Canada. So each webinar is accredited for 2.5 hours for a total of 7.5 hours. So when you fill the evaluation, web, uh, evaluation survey and provide us with your feedback, you'll then be given the opportunity to generate a certificate of attendance, which will have those accredited hours. 
Before I introduce your inspiring moderators, Quinn and Rachel, I'd first like to turn it over to Doris Greenspan, who is the CEO of RNEO, as well as Marilee Nogizic, who is the CEO of, the, of SENA, who will provide you with greetings. Thank you so much, Grace. And uh, Diane, every time that I hear you, uh, I get uh, deeper and deeper both understanding and peace. Your words of wisdom are just so um, uh, uh, authentic in what the time needs now as we speak in the midst of this uh, very challenging time of the pandemic. Um, maybe those times of wisdom, those words of wisdom got to our premier that also announced today or is about to announce uh, that we will pay in this province sick days to people that are most in need, people in precarious employment. So, Diane, I think you reach far, farther, farther than what you even know. I want to uh, welcome especially not only the almost 250 participants, which is just amazing and it shows about the importance of what we are speaking about. It shows about the importance of what our guest speaker, Joseph Pitawanskat, will share with us in terms of connecting culture, land, and wellness to indigenous youth. I want to introduce also and thank Rachel and Quinn for uh, being together with Joseph, as Diane said, uh, the new generation leaders for all of us. So with that, um, greetings from uh, my president, uh, Morgan Offert, my immediate past president, Angela Cooper Brathwaite, uh, my entire board, and of, of course, uh, through Grace and through me, um, and through Tanya that is also facilitating to the, today, our entire staff who stand with you, behind you, uh, on your side, uh, for anything and everything that we can do uh, to uh, continue um, our partnership, to strengthen our partnership, and to uh, make sure that the wisdom that you just shared, Diane, and the wisdom that every, every single time everybody is sharing with us in, in the different uh, learnings that we are getting from knowledge keepers uh, goes wider and deeper and wider and deeper towards reconciliation. So thank you very, very much for having us and for, ha for having us join with you today. Thank you very much, Doris and Mayor Lee. Chimigwech, uh, thank you, Grace. Thank you, Tanya. Um, for the very kind words to opening up this session. Uh, I had an opportunity to speak to the panelists before we came live to this session. And I am so, I am humbled to be in your presence, to know that you are going to teach here today. And I am so grateful to you and privileged to be a part of this audience with you. I am Marilee Nalgizic. I'm originally from the Eagle Clan of the Fort William First Nation near Thunder Bay, Ontario. I currently reside in the unceded territory of the Algonquin people in Ottawa, Ontario. I am the Chief Executive Officer of the Canadian Indigenous Nurses Association. I want to send greetings to all of the registrants in this webinar to the panelists and to the planning committee members whom help coordinate this day. I am very <clears throat> honored to also be a part of what is going to be a very, very um, interesting session for us today. And I'm also very grateful to Doris Greenspun and to her team for coordinating this activity with all of the registered nurses and Ontario, and to extending the invitation to all of the nurses from coast to coast to coast. I look forward to hearing from all of you at some point in your journey on behalf of the Board of Directors of the Canadian Indigenous Nurses Association. Good luck with your webinar. Miigwech. Thank you.
Miigwech, Marilee, and it's an honor to have you on the planning committee. And thank you, Marilee and Doris, for your warm greetings today. I'd now like to introduce you to your youth uh, moderators, Quinn Mihawasigi, as well as Rachel Raddick. Uh, I just wanted to say first, Chi Miigwech, Diane, for the traditional opening today and starting our webinar off in a good way. And thank you, Doris and Miigwech Marlene for all of your welcoming remarks. And thank you everyone for being uh, here and joining us in today's webinar. So, Ani um, Bajo, my name is Rachel Raddick. I'm Ojibwe from Georgina Island with a background being part settler and part Anishinaabe. I'm a registered practical nurse and work in acute care, clinical research and indigenous health. I just finished my uh, RPN to BSCN program with Ontario Tech and have a degree in communication studies as well. So I'm pretty dedicated <laughs> to lifelong learning, I suppose you can say. I'm currently working as a health consultant for the Native Women's Association of Canada and a COVID-19 Indigenous patient navigator for the Southwest Aboriginal Health Access Centre. And I am also one of the founders and co-chairs of the new Indigenous Nurses and Allies Interest Group with the RNAO, which I'm so excited about, and miigwech for allowing me to be here today. Awesome. Uh, we got you, Rachel, for uh, the good introduction. And uh, for everybody who helped pull this together, the planning committee, um, you know, for hosting this space, um, I think it's really important that we can still kind of come together in this way and learn and share. I'm really excited and honored to be able to participate. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Get your ten dog with SJG, on Mom Pima, and uh, yeah. So what I said was just a, a, a kind of a greeting, a welcoming. I introduced who I was. Uh, my name is Quinn Mwasagi. Uh, my community is Serpent River First Nation, and it is located along the north shore of Lake Huron. Um, and uh, my community is a signatory to the Robinson Huron Treaty of 1850. Uh, I recently graduated from Algoma University with a Bachelor of Arts in Community Economic Social Development, as well as a Certificate in Additional Bamuin from uh, Shingwa Kinema Gegamik. And uh, upon graduating, I, I was fortunate enough to receive a grant and I was able to uh, carry out a project uh, called the NIMC Youth Collective. It's a grassroots Indigenous youth-led arts and culture initiative. Um, so lands-based language and cultural vitalization is kind of my passion and, and something I really hope to uh, make more available and more accessible to young people. Um, so I really appreciate um, you reaching out and allowing me to kind of co-host this space uh, to moderate. And also a shout out to Lance and Winter, um, some of the members of the Ontario First Nations Young People's Council here. I'm a former member, so um, check them out. Open YPC, you can check them out and see some of the amazing work and advocacy that they do. Uh, so I really appreciate, uh, you know, the opportunity to come and share. Awesome. So, uh, yes, welcome everybody. Um, we're super excited for today. Um, we're going to do something pretty cool. Um, I'm excited about this. Um, and this is Answer Garden. So I'm not too sure if anybody is familiar with Answer Garden. Um, but it's just going to set some context for today. You want to know a little bit about more about our audience, who you are, and uh, where you are joining us from today. So we're going to be using this answer garden. Uh, we have a few questions. I will be uh, inserting a link into the chat. Uh, you will follow that link and just answer the question. It'll populate the screen and we get to see everybody's results. So um, it will be used... Um, for data collection to help inform today's presentation as well. So we have four questions that are coming up. So I will get them queued up and then Rachel will get them into the chat. Okay, here we are. Awesome. Okay, so the first question. Let's see. Well, the first question is, where are you joining us from today? Yes. So here's the link. I have the first link. So that's the first link. So if you can follow the link, answer the question, 
I'm really excited for this one. I can't wait to see where everybody's joining us from. So the link is there. Oh, all panelists. I think I put it to all panelists and attendees. My apologies, everybody. Thanks for catching that. <laughs> there we go. Awesome, great. And then uh, we have four more questions. So we're gonna be sending four links into the group, into the chat. So the, the next question here, uh, let's see, got it. Okay, so there's the first question that we have. Um, you can enter into the chat, but if you follow the link, it's a really cool exercise and it starts to uh, show where everybody's from on one screen. So if you can follow the link, that would be super great. Rachel with the second question. Okay, so I guess I'll, at first I'll say where I'm joining from too. So I'm joining from Waterloo today. Um, and then our second question is, what sector do you currently work in? And if you are a med student or a nursing student, uh, if you wouldn't mind identifying what year in school you're with, that would be really great. Super cool. Awesome. Oh, I'm so excited to see what these are. Awesome. So I'm going to loop back to these questions very shortly. Um, so, and we're just going to move on with the question. So if you can, there'll be uh, a, a couple links that you can follow. So uh, the third question that we have. So our third question is, do you identify as First Nations, Métis or Inuit or settler or ally? Awesome. Great. And the last question that I have here. So our, our last question uh, is more of a fun one just to get everyone a little bit more connected uh, virtually. So it's, what is your favorite hobby? Awesome. Wow, this is super cool. So I'm going to share my screen because this is awesome. So um, who's ever currently sharing the screen, I'm going to stop your screen share. And I want to check it out. So look at this. This is super cool. So this is where everybody's joining us from today. Got a lot, 15 people from Toronto, but we have people from Petawawa, uh, Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. Like, wow, this is just amazing. Tikmikshing, North Bay, Aurora, Rama, Barry. Oh, this is so cool. Wow, this is awesome. Cool. There are a few people in the chat as well that have said where they're from too. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Okay. So the other questions, it's not allowing me to, uh, I don't know how to get rid of that there. Here, I'll try and reshare. Cool, so we have, I just wanted to show this one once more so we can see what some of the answers are. Cool, look at this. And it, this is the one that shows the sectors. So this is the one uh, will show the different sectors that everybody is uh, working in here uh, that will be joining us with this today. So. Uh, public health, we have nursing education, healthcare, uh, retired from education sector, registered nurse, uh, universities, uh, children's mental health, um, child and youth, uh, Six Nations, environmental research. So it's really shows and captures, you know, um, where everybody's coming from today. So I, I really love this. This is so cool. And you can use this as well if you do any other online stuff uh, to show, um, to show kind of, it's really cool demonstration. So it's called Answer Garden and I encourage everybody to check it out. Uh, it's super cool. Um, and I just wanna share this screen. It's not working too well for me. So I'll do this one more time here. Uh, and let's see where, uh, how everybody identifies here today. So we have a lot of First Nations. We have a lot of Southern allies, allies, uh, Francophone allies, first generation Canadian, uh, identify as Indigenous from Africa, Métis and First Nation, um, Settler and Aspiring Ally. So super cool. That's uh, really awesome to see. So the last one was, what is your favorite hobby? So just kind of, I want to see what this one is. I'd like to see what everybody's hobbies are. It's just super cool. So uh, I'll be sharing the screen one more time. Um, thanks for your patience, everybody. I think it's just a really cool exercise to do. Uh, just to kind of get to know everybody and kind of just really paints a really cool picture. So we have a lot of hikers out there, people who love reading, gardening. I love gardening too, running, walking, earth ships, avoiding COVID, working on the land, embroidery, biking. Oh, this is so cool. You guys are an amazing bunch of people. You sound like a lot of fun playing guitar. Awesome. Cool. So 
yeah, we just wanted to do that to see where everybody was from, the different sectors that is joining us today. So um, check it out. You can use it in your programs or however you see Answer Garden. It's super fun, super easy. Um, but yeah, we just wanted to kind of start us off that way. Sweet. Miigwech. Miigwech, Quinn. That was awesome. And from the, the chat and what I'm seeing here, everyone is really engaged and really, really enjoying being uh, able to... Uh, participate online. So before we do go further ahead, uh, we would just like to say miigwech to all nurses, nursing students, and healthcare providers for all the hard work that you've been doing for over the past year with COVID and all the sacrifices that you have had to do while working on the front lines. So miigwech for that, miigwech for taking time to still be here today. Awesome. And a few housekeeping items before we go on with the presentation. So Quinn and myself will be monitoring the chat uh, for questions. So uh, we'll be keeping our eyes on the chat. If you do have questions while the presentation is going on uh, and there will be a half hour at the end allotted to answer any questions that individuals do have. Mm -hmm. Great, awesome. So I guess now we're gonna be moving into our main speaker, Joseph uh, Pedawanaquit, or Bidanquit. So uh, we're super excited to have Joseph uh, join us today. Um, so um, I, I guess I'll introduce him. Uh, Rachel, is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> so um, Joseph uh, Bidanquit is Ojibwe from Wequemkong, unceded Indian Territory on Manitoulin Island. He is an educator who specializes in plant-based medicine and is the founder and director of Creators Garden, a 365 days a year Indigenous outdoor education based business. Um, I've had the opportunity to walk around the, in the bush with Joseph and his, uh, his family and uh, really exciting and awesome. Um, it just, it's, uh, you guys are in for a treat today. Um, so I'm really looking forward to this presentation. And uh, if you can, you can find Creators Garden on, if you are on Facebook or social media, as well as Instagram, um, check it out. I encourage you, really awesome content. So I thought I'd drop that link. Um, but other than that, uh, I would like to hand it over to Joseph and, uh, you know, take it away. Perfect. All righty. <laughs> Woohoo. <clears throat> okay. Sweet. Ah, okay. Well, holy man, I've been waiting for this for a, for a, for a while. Um, Diane reached out like months ago <laughs> and I was like, I'm in. Man, what a solid way to start out too from getting to hear from Diane. That was awesome. Um, and then, <laughs> oh, geez. Okay, it's going to be good. That was, that was a solid way to start. Um, Answer Garden is super cool. Um, okay, so um, I have a bunch of cool things that I want to share, share with everybody. Okay, so I was asked to kind of uh, stick to a few few important topics you know if anybody has ever taken a part in any of our sessions you probably know that i could really jump all over the place especially if i uh have a little too much coffee which i think i did <laughs> uh but yeah still we're gonna have a blast anyways uh hopefully everything's all good to go uh i'm good to go um yeah like quinn said i am uh, from Wikwemkong on Manitoulin Island from Wiki and um, was born, born raised, just moved to Peterborough, Ontario just within the last couple of years. Uh, wait, like five years now. <laughs> I better stop saying that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I've been in Peterborough for a while and um, <clears throat> we, we spend like all of our time teaching about um, plant-based medicine, about uh, working with different, uh, <laughs> all 
indigenous communities throughout Ontario. Like all we did was travel for like uh, five years or so. Um, and But there was an issue kind of with us being on Manitoulin. Um, not a lot of communities in Southern Ontario could really access our services. Uh, it, was, it was really far away. And so we moved here. <laughs> and we've been able to get to London in three hours, could get to Ottawa in three hours. Like Peterborough is, I get to North Bay in three hours. Just feels super close to everybody but home. <laughs> uh, but anyways, um, yeah, I've been here for a couple of years. Uh, now we've kind of shifted and adapted our, uh, our business, I guess, to being online and man, I'm super happy to be a part of this webinar series or this webinar. Um, I've been thinking about it for a really long time, all of the different things that I want to share. So I'm just going to jump right into it. One of the things I wanted to mention is that kind of leaving lots of time at the end for a Q and A. Uh, that's for two reasons, because I really want to be able to have a discussion and engage in the conversation, engage with the audience, but also um, I like going over my time limit <laughs> and having a Q&A. <laughs> so, geez, I better get going. Um, yeah, a couple of really interesting things that I wanted to share. One of the things that I always like to really make sure uh, that we all have a really solid understanding of um, um, is, is um, just kind of the importance of everything that I'm going to be talking about tonight. Um, uh, it, so um, in um, Nishnabe language, every sound means something. Every sound does something. And, uh, you know, it's like a verb based language. And when you listening, when you listen to somebody speak, you get to watch and experience the, the whole story that they're telling. And, uh, and, and so I remember like whatever, I was having a conversation with my wife, uh, and we were talking about education. We were talking about learning and knowledge and understanding. And, uh, for whatever reason, it drew us to asking my grandma, who was our main source of knowledge and inspiration to learn the things that I'm teaching about today, uh, spent some time with her. And uh, to, I, I wanted to ask her the way, how would we describe knowledge in the Shnabe language? And she said, like two weeks later, I even forgot that I asked her the question, but she called me two weeks later and she said, uh, I have a answer to your question. It's like, yeah, which one <laughs> from two weeks ago? Um, the way that we would describe knowledge, the closest that she could possibly think of is a word, I'll put it in the chat here, um, is awadzuin. Awadzuin is knowledge. And um, in the Shlava language, every sound means something else. Every sound does something to a word. So like my last name is Pidankut. Um uh, and it's talking about a cloud, like onkut is a cloud. You could kind of talk about clouds all day long, onkut, 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 uh, you know, whatever. Uh, but when you say bid onkut, when you put the B sound in the beginning of a word that makes that entity you are speaking about manifest itself in a physical form. So bid onkut is clouds that you can see, clouds that you need to be able to see. And so, um, uh, that's bidankut. Those clouds have manifested themselves in a physical form right there. Bidankut. So I guess somebody was born a long time ago and, uh, you know, they look out the window. Okay, what's going on? Oh, there's clouds coming here. Bidankut. That's what his name is. <laughs> and it's stuck. <laughs> uh so um that's what the b sound does and you know like so like even when we talk about light we'll say b dobbin that's light that that's manifesting itself in a physical form first thing in the morning when you first see the the light coming up uh anytime you see that b sound in the beginning of a word it makes it so that that entity is physical that it has manifested itself in a physical form so knowledge um um our word for knowledge, oadzuin, if you put a B sound in the beginning of that word and you make it bimadzuin, uh, let me write that down, bimadzuin, that's knowledge that you can see. Uh, knowledge that has manifested itself in a physical form right in front of you. Knowledge that's staring at you in the face, that's bimadzuin. And 
probably most of everybody that's listening to this can kind of understand bim matsu and is also the word that we use to describe life itself and uh like you'll probably be able to identify later in the presentation my grandma she she really she's a thinker and um uh she's a thinker and <laughs> We were having a conversation with her after me and my wife and we we're like okay so life the word that we used to describe life is knowledge that has manifested itself in a physical form and so we were having a conversation with my grandma and it basically just turned into well no one's alive right now i guess <laughs> like it suddenly became really hard for us to use the anishinaabe language to describe us as being as beings who achieved the ability to live uh, because, because for the most part, we don't have the knowledge that's required to be able to live in this part of the world. And so in order for us to be able to live in this part of the world, we're, we're, we're living in a system that's floating on top of Ontario. Um, and so uh, everything that we do to stay alive is all a part of this system that's floating on top of Ontario. And, and, and so, uh, be, and the reason why we're living inside of the system is because we don't have the knowledge that we need to be able to go to Ontario, to be able to go to the land. We don't have that, the Oadzuin to be able to get, to be able to achieve Bimadzuin. And so it's a really neat idea. Uh, like if you think about all of the things that you do on a daily basis to stay alive, where you get your food, how you transport yourself around, uh, when you get sick or injured, you know, we go to the doctor and then to the pharmacist and to no frills and we drive in a Ford. Um, and so the, we're all kind of floating in the system because we don't have the knowledge that we need to go to Ontario. And one interesting thing that I really like everybody to try to do is to kind of take like, take five seconds, think about the top 10 experiences that you've had in the last two years. I have to say two years now because of the, of the last year we've been going through is unusual, but some of us have to stretch two years, but think of the, the, just in the past little, the, the past while of your life, Think about the top five moments, the top 10 moments where you felt the most alive, where you felt the most life coursing through your veins, where, where you felt so good. For most of us, it's when we have done what we needed to do to get the knowledge that we need to go to the land, to go to Ontario, to go to Nishnabeke. Uh, like when we um, grow food, we make, we make a garden. Last March and April, you couldn't buy, couldn't buy seeds anywhere, not even online. They were all gone because everybody was planting them. So I'm assuming that everybody got to make a garden, except me, because all the seeds were gone. And so um, a lot of us have that experience where we get to eat food that we have participated in growing uh, and where we feel uh, alive, where we get the knowledge that we need to be able to go on a hiking trip, uh, a camping trip, a canoe trip the hunting trip, a fishing trip, uh, when we get the knowledge that we need to go to Ontario, to go to Anishinaabe King, then that's where we feel the most alive. Uh, we get little, little tickles of that experience of what it must be like to be able to be fully engaged with the land, to be fully engaged with the knowledge that is responsible for the culture, that is responsible for retaining uh, the culture that's responsible for retaining the knowledge that's required to be able to live in this part of the world uh, is capable of providing uh, um, uh, the mazun, like a, a good life. And so um, what I really wanted to talk about today is um, medicine knowledge, medicine knowledge that is required to be able to uh, live in this part of the world. Uh, and so medicine knowledge is is a super super important part of of uh of our culture and of our knowledge base and um uh i have a few really awesome things that i that i wanted to be able to run through today um but that's a really neat idea to be able to understand so basically the one of the main parts that we're going to be talking about today is uh when we get sick or injured um to give us the knowledge that we need to go to Ontario and to say, what do you have for us? <laughs> What's here? What can help me here? Uh, one really interesting thing is, um, is that, 
how do I say? Um, yeah, well, I kind of just want to jump right into it, but I don't want to jump ahead of myself. See, I'm catching myself. Um, but uh, <clears throat> One of my one of the one of my favorite ideas. So we'll start sort of macro and work our way down. Um, to a certain degree, the 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 medicine knowledge that exists in this part of the world is super super important, uh, and in a way, the whole world looks to this geo region. Uh, this geographical location, the Great Lakes uh, of, of North America, as being the hub of medicine, where medicine comes from. Uh, and in a way, yeah, the whole world looks to this place, to looks to our home to, for medicine. Uh, and, and one way to understand this is to just looking at drug discovery. Over 85% of every drug that has been discovered comes from plants. And this is not plants from the Amazon or, or from, uh, from other medicine practices around the world, TCM or Ayurvedic medicine or from uh, Europe, Northern European countries. Most of the drugs that have been discovered to create the pharmaceutical industry, the system that we call Western medicine, most of those medications come from plants that are indigenous to the Great Lakes region, come from the Schnabeke, come from Shkikiyadzu, and come from this knowledge base, this culture. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and I want to be able to talk about this partnership uh, between the two that have joined together indigenous knowledge and science to be able to create the system that, that our world to, to a large degree relies on to be able to stay alive and well. Uh, and the... Um, uh, um, understanding that is super important uh, because it kind of like the the Great Lakes region has a really special place in the right in the middle of it all. Right in the middle of it all, we have Manitoulin Island, um, Nidomnis, uh, uh, which is uh, one of the most diverse uh, as far as uh, uh, flora goes. One of the most diverse. Uh, areas on this entire continent uh, as far as flowers and plants and trees and things go. On Manitoulin Island you get every single plant that grows in this entire geo region is all scrunched onto this one tiny island and on top of that there's 17 wildflowers that grow there that don't grow anywhere else in the entire world. One of those flowers blooms once every 10 years. This is a medicine island. It's an island of huge mystery so we call it the Midomnissing. Uh, Nido is a word or Manitou is a word that's sometimes used to describe spirit. Um, uh, and, and, but what that word is essentially talking about is something that is, there's something that you can't see. There's something happening there that we cannot see and that we cannot fully understand. Uh, and, and Manitoulin Nidomnis is uh, uh, um, a representation of that experience of, of a mystery. When, and the mystery is that is the diversity. How can all of our medicines grow in one spot? And this island for, for thousands of years was very heavily protected. Um, and for that reason, uh, to be able to protect all of the different medicines that we have, uh, that diversity that I'm calling upon, that di diversity that I'm remembering is, is even after the entire island was burnt from end to end to wipe out the rattlesnakes, uh, burnt from end to end to in the 1700s. And that diverse, this is the diversity that we're left with. So some people will ask, you know, like who knows what is in the soil still, or who knows what that diversity was like even previous to the 1700s. Uh, so that's a really special place. And that's the place that I was raised, <laughs> the place that I call home. Um, and then my family too. Uh, my family, I have a really, really incredible family full of amazing uh, knowledge holders. My grandma being uh, uh, a really amazing resource for my community to remember how to speak our language uh, and to teach us how to speak our language. And um, for quite a few years, uh, when I was young, we started to lose a lot of our main 
medicine knowledge holders, those who we who who dedicated their lives to understanding medicine. Uh, uh, um, we lost quite a few of them in a very short period of time. So this whole knowledge base, medicine knowledge, seemed as though it was disappearing really fast. So I left academia faster than <laughs> anything and uh, dedicated time with my grandma because uh, she had was, you know, pro probably one of the last people in my community and Wikwam Kong, it's seen as like a education or culture, cultural hub, knowledge epicenter of the Anishinaabe people. Um, and in this entire community, my grandma was one of the last uh, um, knowledge holders that we had. She had something really, really special, uh, dedicating time with her mother when she was growing up. Her mother was a midwife, that was, and that was their role within our community. Uh, she was such a sought-after midwife that people would move from communities all over the place to move to Wiki uh, to be under her care. Uh, so she had something really, really special. And uh, um, and then yeah, that was my grandma. Like of all places to 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 live in the Great Lakes region, a place where the world gestures to for understanding and experiencing medicine, uh, and then to be from Manitoulin Island, then to be from Wikwemakong, and then to have my grandma, <laughs> it was just like the everything just seemed to be perfect, and so we start dedicating time with her to be able to capture the, as much of this knowledge as we can. And as we were capturing it, uh, um, we were asked to teach about it. And, um, and, and then basically just here we are today. <laughs> uh, and so this knowledge is super important. Um, and the, the, um, you know what I want to do to you guys real fast, uh, is, is we, is, um, Real quick, just to kind of preface the the real uh, content that I wanted to run through, we have um, the the language that we use to be able to to be able to describe this land that we the the land that we live on. It's really really incredible. So I kind of wanted to give us a little bit of a taste as to how amazing this language is if you if you haven't already got that epiphany by now. The um um every single plant has a whole experience attached to its name. When you hear a name of a plant, um your mouth will water. You your your brain will imagine and create phantom sounds uh um the 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 um when you hear the names of plants you'll be able to identify and understand connections and relationships uh that that plant has with other plants with other animals with with specific types of minerals uh and and it allows it just the name of the plant will allow you to peer into the the outrageous connectedness that exists in in Nishnabe in this part of the world so this this plant's really awesome uh example of that this is our uh um it's a bone medicine that we use uh um for like when your bones get brittle to help with development so osteoporosis to help with development in children uh so that the all of the connective tissue is growing appropriately so to help with growing pains and things like that it's used to recover from pregnancy uh because like one of the things that we know one of the things the most one of the important things that you could learn from midwives traditional midwives is that your kids even before they're born, I'll already stealing everything from you. <laughs> so your calcium stores are gone and you need to replenish those after having a baby uh, and, and breastfeeding that baby. <clears throat> uh, you need to replenish those calcium stores. And, uh, and so this, this medicine was there. It's a medicine for your bones. Um, and, and uh, it mainly has this strengthening quality to it. And, and um the the um it's called gazibanashk gazibanashk is um 
is a perfect name. Kazib and Mash. Uh, so it's called Gazib and Ashk, Scouring Rush or Ecosidum Haimali is the Latin name. Uh, but this name is super incredible. And I kind of want you to understand this as we, uh, when, whenever you hear anybody kind of talking about any of the uh, uh, medicines, any of the plants and, and kind of just like the Anishinaabe language, generally, it's a really good way to kind of understand this. But um, Gazib and Ashk is... Um, uh, I remember when we were picking it, when I first found it, this medicine kind of was like always beside a little creek or always beside a river. Uh, and, and just in my own head, I started to kind of realize this plant, Gazibanashk, is always by a river, Zibe or Zibi, it's like a creek. And so I was like, hey, I kind of made a connection. It's my own language in my own head. So I ran over to my grandma, uh, well, ran, drove, uh, then, then ran, uh, but my car was still in drive. I get so excited every time I, I make these connections. Uh, but the, um, I ran into the, my grandma's house and said, Hey, a bunch of real dirty plants, dirt everywhere. And, uh, and I said, Hey, I, I think I know why this is called Gazivanashk. And she kind of looks and she was like, Oh, well, why? <laughs> I was like, well, it's always by a river, Gazibanush, Gaziba, Zibi. It's like it's always by a river or a creek. And she was like, Oh, never even thought of that before. And I was like, you know, like she my community relies on her uh to to a large degree to understanding the Shnave language. How come she never even thought of this? She grew up picking it. I thought this is crazy. And so she said, Oh, I I had never thought of it because I remember I was just a kid. My grandma was, or she, she said, I, I was my mom, I was sitting on the porch and my mom was coming up behind me and it, she's walking real slow. I thought, I wonder if she's sneaking and she could kind of hear rustling noises. Um, and her mom had a giant bundle of gazebanash that was already dry and kind of was sneaking up behind my grandma and, and then rubbed all those plants together. Uh, and so one of the things that you could see uh, from the Gzibanashk is that the stem, it's, it's just like one stem. It's just like one limb kind of poking out of the ground and it's got these ridges. All those ridges on the outside of this plant are full of silica, full of uh, um, glass, full of sandpaper, really hard abrasive crystals in the outer portion of this plant. And so when they all rub together and they're amplified by that spongy part and the hollow center, uh, so it ends up making a super, super loud noise. And my grandma didn't expect it. So she heard screaming. It sounded like somebody was screaming. And then she took off and ran to the end of the driveway and looked back and her mom was laughing with that big bundle of the medicine. And she said, uh, she explained to her what that sound was. Gazib and Ashk, uh, this, the reason why we call it Kazibanashk is because it screams at you. A sinue is a scream. A sinue, it's the name that we use to describe foxes too, because what foxes are doing right now, they're screaming. <laughs> uh, and then the, um, and so a sinue is a common last name in indigenous communities in Ontario. And so a sinue is a word that we use to describe foxes. Uh, or when you put a green log into a fire and it whines at you, a sinue. And so gazibanush, gazinue, that makes that screaming sound. That's why we call it this. That's what her mom was saying. She was like, that's what I always thought. And so I was like, oh, okay. That's incredible. That's plant then it has two meanings where where it grows and what it sounds like uh and, and then so i went to a medicine knowledge holder in my community who's also a fluent speaker and really good at understanding shaba language so i went to him and i explained this to him and he and he was like oh i never thought of that before because he actually drinks the tea often uh it's one of his favorites and the one of the reasons why it's his favorite is because when, when you drink it, it's, it kind of tastes sweet inside of your mouth. But then when you swallow it, after you swallow it, you kind of take a breath and your mouth gets a little sour tasting. And it kind of draws you in to drink more of the tea. Uh, you swallow it and you get that kind of sour taste. Ugh, so you drink more. 
and and it's the best like in kindergarten classes because they'll drink so much of this um <clears throat> and um but yeah he said uh that sour taste Gasilbogan, that's what that word is describing. Gasibanashk, it's describing the taste that it has. Gasilbogan, it has a sour taste. Uh, and that sour taste calls you to drink more. And so this plant is teaching us that that we can drink a lot of it and that it's super important for us. Uh, some plants will be bitter. Some plants will be so horrible tasting. It's the worst thing that touch your face and your face will want to throw it all over the wall. Uh, and, and those plants are telling you, you know, you got to be careful. This one though, just calls you in and draws you in, keep drinking. Uh, and in, in traditional Chinese medicine, they have a way of understanding how plants are used. Uh, what, what, aspect of your life that they help based on the taste and that taste when something is sweet in your mouth and sour when you swallow it when a plant calls you to be drinking more those are plants that are that in tcm or in traditional chinese medicine are aimed at giving you what you need to be strong when you're old uh um that 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 um <clears throat> the way it is, is explained to me is that this culture uh is obsessed with be, uh, maintaining strength in throughout old age. And so we could see that in this medicine being a really amazing medicine for your bones uh, to keep your bones nice and strong throughout your entire life. When we use this in sort of a geriatric setting uh, with osteoporosis, generally we're working with different senior centers across Ontario um, and engaging in this one medicine, this one bone medicine, uh, one of the most common plants that's distributed across every single continent on the planet um so very easy to access generally in a, every indigenous community that we go to when we get our old people drinking this medicine um their bone density goes from osteoporosis so 20 or below uh to beyond the scale to over 100 more often than not over 120 and hospitals like uh sudbury uh or health sciences north sudbury regional hospital uh winnipeg and in uh thunder bay there's uh, a lot of physicians that work in in these institutes that understand there's a there's a contest <laughs> when these groups of groups of old women come in and start scoring over 120 on their bone density score the bone density scale that generally is able to go to 100 you know it's a little bit of an uh, of a of a iffy kind of uh scale uh, but anyways uh you get all of these women who are uh and old men who are osteoporosis um have osteoporosis in in just a matter of weeks they scoring beyond the scale uh so having stronger bones than the physician's children you know and so like what is happening here well I, they all just drinking this tea <laughs> and so <clears throat> they turned it into a contest uh and so far the highest as far as i as far as i know is uh 137 uh was the highest bone density score uh, from a woman in Wikwemkong who used this medicine to give her bones what they needed to be nice and strong so that her bones were, were had the structural integrity that she needed throughout old age. So that part of her didn't fail. <laughs> uh, and so uh, medicinal knowledge, Mshkikiyadzu and plant medicine's role is to prevent the onset of chronic disease as late and as long into someone's life as possible. Uh, and, you know, one of the most beautiful things is we can see uh, Western medicine, pharmaceutical medicine, as being responsible for or masters at giving us what we need to be able to live with chronic disease as comfortably for and healthfully as long as possible. So this is a great partnership uh, and needs to be understood and explored as a partnership. And uh, this is a really good example of that. Uh, responsible for preventing the onset of these chronic diseases that are very responsible for removing old people from our communities, hip replacements, and, you know, maybe a year life expectancy after, after a surgery like that. Uh, so there's, uh, there's really, really important um, roles that medicine has to play, but I kind of wanted to share this one right off the hop, just to be able to share with you, you know, it has three ways, three interpretations to its name. It tells you where it grows. 
tells you what it tastes like, what it sounds like. And then you know what I even did one time is I presented that information to my, I sat on a language committee thing in, in Wiklam Kong in my community. And uh, I gave them this presentation on this medicine. One of the things that I explained to them though, is that this plant, you know, it deposits one of the reasons why it's really good for your bone health is because of the amount of silica and salicylic acid that it has inside of it, which is responsible for shuttling the, the calcium into the periosteum, uh, really necessary for that process. So this plant, 13% silica, that's all in the ribbed outer portion of the plant. Um, and so um, the... The plant's called Scouring Rush. You saw the English name. It's called Scouring Rush because this was the scouring pad before the industrialization of steel wool. This was a scouring pad like at Home Depot in the 30s or in the 20s. This is what you would get bundles of this plant. Obviously, everybody just did it themselves. But silica is glass. It's a hard abrasive crystal that you use to clean everything down with. You use it as a scouring pad to scrub things. And one of the women that was a part of that uh, language committee explained to me that do the dishes, clean the dishes, or the way my dad tells me to have a shower, she 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 says, uh, like that's the uh to clean to clean your butt. It's not talking about cleaning, it's not talking about soap. Gazibi is talking about scrubbing something, wiping something down. So is to scrub the dishes, is to scrub your butt. Uh, and, and, and so gazibanashk is, that's what this word is talking about as well as teaching is telling you a, a really important utility purpose that it has, a, 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 you know, embedded into the identity of the plant. And so we call upon that identity when we, when we, when, when we name this plant gazibanashk telling you where it grows, what it sounds like, what it tastes like, a uh, utility purpose that it has. Uh, and so all of these different interpretations that are built into the name of this plant, when you're walking through the forest now, and you're going past the uh, Gazibanashk, and you remember Gazibanashk, you remember Kasiul Bagan, your mouth will pucker like as if like Gazil uh, Abu is vinegar or Gazil Buck is rhubarb and, and like that sour taste like from a lemon. Um, and so you have a really visceral reaction. You understand a sound that it can make, the screaming sound that it makes like a fox or like a green log in a fire. Uh, you can understand the ecosystem that it is dominant in, that it grows in. Uh, and then you can know how it can be used uh, and, and to be used to scrub things down with. And so all of that is just embedded into the one name of the plant. And then you gesture out at, at 250 different species of plants that are, you know, in the same forest that it, that it's in all of them, which have names, all of the different birds, you know, everything that Diane was acknowledging earlier this afternoon, all of those have proper names and all of those names have really incredible understandings uh, and identities embedded within them. And so learning the Shaba language, it really just opens all of your senses. Uh, and this can just be when somebody is telling you a story. Gazibanashk is one word as a part of a story. Imagine how everything else all fits together uh, and the reactions and responses that you're going to have inside of your body. It's a really special um it's a really special thing, and I encourage everybody to to understand, uh, to learn and understanding the names of plants is probably one of the most important accomplishments in understanding mshkikiyadzun and understanding medicine knowledge. Uh, the names is a is a huge opportunity, a huge endeavor. Um, but I kind of wanted to uh, shift gears a little bit <laughs> um, and kind of talk about the um where is it uh, ba, 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 ba. yeah so um i'm i'm really excited for this 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 flower to you know come around um so you know what before we go there I just wanted to be able to share with you back to Gazibanashk. I wanted to be able to share with you, uh, you know, I kept saying identity of this plant. Uh, and one of the things that, that, that I really wanted to share just regarding connection uh, and, and uh, um, 
connection and creation and you know what our youth need to thrive um <laughs> so it's a really amazing thing um is that we have um we have there's a you know a part so our creation story in our creation story and like every creation story that i that i've ever heard um there is a moment where everything has already been created except people um and everything that has already been created uh is all working the way that it should and um to sort of finish this finish this off icing on the cake kind of thing we were created people were created and if you listen to the moments where at where we were created um there was a really important consultation and i think uh diane ex said it pretty explicitly uh is that there's a consultation between the creator and everything that has already been created up until that point um which is all of the elements that make up earth are all represented by the the shell that we are lying in uh the same sort of the same sort of shell that we use to carry fire uh we have uh uh, a really important teaching that explains that a fire should e only ever be made on the land. Uh, and so that shell is a representation of the land. That rep it's, a, it's a representation of all of the elements that make up earth. Uh, and and uh, that's where our bodies were formed from, was formed from everything that had already been created here to be able to make us, to be able to make our physical bodies. And the creator's contribution was to breathe um, spirit into us and to to have us be the beings that we are today um that that was uh the a partnership that was responsible for making us um the land and the spirit and so we're a culmination of all of the elements that make up earth and one of the things that i really like to do in all of the work that we that that we do is really really try to show everybody that you you can there's evidence of this you can see this and every single plant is a mirror image of the way that you look on the inside the way that your body looks even the structures the geometry that your body has under an electron microscope there there are reflections of this in creation and you could see um uh whether you want to call it evidence or memory of that partnership or of that event taking place and those um uh where all of the plants sort of look like the body part that you know one of the part of you that that was formed from that plant <laughs> uh so i have i hope this makes sense i kind of lost my thoughts there for a second but the um with the scouring rush you can see the 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 identity of this plant's purpose embedded into its structure so it has the really hard outside where it deposits all the silica it has a spongy part of the middle and a hollow center uh so the structure of this plant is structured just like every single bone in your body the periosteum on the outside spongy bone in the middle and a hollow center for marrow and then also the scouring rush is going to have all of these joints and if you separate each of those joints there's this really slippery slimy fluid in there just like the synovial fluid in in our joints and then you look at this plant's eff efficacy or effectiveness at like synovialitis like when you get when you just like have to get moving in the morning do some abcs with every single joint you have before you can make your coffee like its ability to control uh um inflammation in connective tissue in your body is really really incredible um and then you could see you know from the stories earlier how amazing it is for your bones uh and how you can see the the that you know that's that's uh that's where we were formed from uh and if we remember those connections we're going to be able to tap into uh and 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 an understanding of you know healing this plant has the ability to restore normal function to that part of our body you know, it was responsible for creating it in the first place and so it's a really fun fascinating idea while we're walking through the forest to be able to look at all of these different plants and 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 kind of understand that that's where we came from and in within those connections 
uh, we can know how to help different parts of us, help how to help different parts of our body. Uh, so another one um, um, would be like sweet fern, um, Comptonia peregrina or Gabaagamish, we call it. Um, this one being um, really, really important medicine for your intestines, and in its ability to uh, um, stop the effects of stress of adrenaline and cortisol on your intestines ability to create mucin um, and so engaging in this medicine is restoring and regulating your intestines ability to produce mucin the sealant of uh, preventing the bacteria from getting out into your body and creating this massive inflammatory and eventually autoimmune response that leads to um, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease two diseases of which are becoming outrageously common uh, this is a medicine that we use and engage in on a regular basis to to you know keep your intestines in check and it has a really really amazing cinnamon taste uh, the seeds of it taste just like you know you can be used in cooking just like cinnamon and so you could turn your food into that medicine and to keep that part of your body in check and always experiencing that therapy that this plant is able to offer uh, and, and to be able to correct and restore normal function to your nagajin, to your intestines, and, and really stop the number one or primary source of systemic inflammation, your, your guts, uh, and, and the amount of relief that people feel. And just engaging in this one medicine is absolutely incredible to be able to feel uh, the inflammation coming down, <laughs> uh, getting your CRP below five uh sometimes for the first time in your life it's really really incredible so this plant has a really important role and and just in the structure of it just the way the leaves look you can see like i've sent people to highway 17 go to anywhere in ontario where you pick blueberries and look for your colon look for your nagajin and everyone is able to find this plant because the leaves of it look just like a like your intestines and so it's kind of like wow that you could see the that identity in the structure of this plant and the connection that you have with it that's the part of your body where you were created where that part of your body was created from and and experiencing that connection again is going to be responsible for restoring normal function uh teaching it how to work properly again so that uh in in technical terms this one uh well maybe we won't get too technical right now um we have a lot of really amazing experiences with all of our medicine, getting uh, community and youth engaged in this process for them to be able to experience and witness how like all these kids in, in Pekanj took this medicine home and made tea with it and all have stories of what that one plant, what this one medicine that covered their community did to the mobility of their family as you know some of the family members that were aging and mobility was limited this plant was the gazebanashk was responsible for you know getting them up and out of the house again walking around engaging in exercise preventing frailty and metabolic disease uh so it was really incredible i'm gonna f go through a couple other ones here um <clears throat> so I kind of wanted to make sure that I that I'm able to share the importance of this connection, uh, connection to the land, connection to the creation, and connection to the culture that's responsible for maintaining the knowledge that's required to be able to live here. Uh, and so, when you start experiencing that and engaging with that, you're able to see the lives that that the 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 life that we are capable of is really really incredible. <clears throat> And be able to give us better clarity in our understanding of how how we used to live, how we used to age. Or you think like three dads ago, think of like great great grandpa. Uh, they were living to be a hundred years old, over a hundred years old, well into their nineties, uh, and they were still moose hunting, putting fifteen cords of wood away, uh, um, setting nets, and tilling the garden with draft horses. So like that that's who we are that's how we age that's the health that we're capable of there has been a degradation that 
is a degradation of knowledge and the importance of being able to recapture that and incorporate this knowledge back into our practices and into our homes is going to have an effect and that effect to be able to drive us closer towards achieving that again. Um, and so <clears throat> this one, Northern Prickly Ash, Gawkamish, Xanthoxylum Americanus is the Latin name. Um, this is a really a, a amazing medicine. I, I, my mom is a, here t tonight. Uh, she's a registered nurse. I always grew up with the RN pins on the fridge and those little gold pins and then big stacks of RN magazines and playing with them. And uh, <clears throat> I play this game with my mom, show her plants and like, what's this? no context just throwing plants on my mom what is that she'll kind of look at it and like well you know kind of looks like uh uh <clears throat> maybe i will show you guys real quick oh man i just can't help it i showed her this one i did that to her once mom what's this she's like oh she's like look at those two two lobes on either side look like uh look like twins so she thought of kidneys lungs and she said nope ovaries Look at that appendage on the bottom and she she said those ridges are are the the same shape and structure on the cervix she and she named them whatever they're whatever they're called i haven't uh dedicated myself to memorizing the tissues that she did <laughs> uh but uh she said oh looks like a female reproductive system oh and then she said oh but i'm wrong gotta be wrong because it's missing you know the giant uterus the, the big bleedy thing in the middle of it all. And so I showed her that, no, she, she was right. Because you see in the background of that picture, that red, uh, that red is the roots. So the stem is in the center of the plant that goes down to the root. And the root of this plant is called blood root, squeugebic or sanguinaria canadensis. Uh, and the root of this plant, when you break it, a bunch of red juices come out, but you see like, even from this big blurry image, you could see that it comes out on the perimeter to really show you that endometrial lining. And then you have this, uh, tissue looking fleshy part in the middle. Uh, um, and so, you know, that's the, that's the uterus. And so we're able to see the identity of this plant in the parts of our body that were formed from this part of creation to be able to make us who we are and in that consultation back and understanding these connections and, and consulting with them we're able to restore normal proper function and so using blood roots or skujibic as a really amazing women's medicine to be able to uh mediate growth hormones uh in in the female reproductive system essentially you know um blocking VEGF or vasoendothelial growth factor from being present inside of a uterine fibroid or an ovarian cyst or a polyp on the mucous membranes, then the excessive tissue is hormonally, essentially hormonally rejected. And when VEGF is, is rejected in the, in that tissue, it loses circulation, it loses oxygen and turns, it just gets choked and it turns black and falls off. Um, <clears throat> and, and so being able to uh, have such an effect on women's health to be able to uh, help with fibroids, polyps, and cysts. Uh, this medicine has a really important role in giving women every, the tool that they need to be able to function properly. And it's just remembering where we came from in the first place. <laughs> uh, and so it's a lot, a lot of really amazing ideas that, I, you know, it's kind of beyond the scope of, of this, but I really wanted to share a couple more. Uh, so I showed this one to my mom uh, and I like flashed it in front of her face for three seconds while she was watching Young and the Restless crocheting. Uh, like many of us are just about getting ready to do. Uh, but the um, just flashed it in front of her real fast. was like, hey, what's this? And she was like, oh, I don't know. It looks like roots from your teeth. And um, 
I always freak out when she does this. And so I took off two of those tines off of Gawkamish, Northern Prickly Ash, Xanthoxylum Americanus, took off two of those tines and, ex and it left a scar on the root, on the stem that looked exactly like a molar crown. Uh, and then I get to show my mom the fruit of this plant looking like your tongue, even having all of the different uh, taste buds on your tongue. And to explain this medicine's role in drawing out calcium from every sensory neuron in your mouth, in your gums, especially uh, blocking the pain signals from being sent from the sensory neuron to the DRG, to your brain, to be able to feel pain. So that's the saponin that's inside of the bark and the berries from this plant inhibit um, uh, uh, or stop pain in your mouth and this is absorbed the saponin is absorbed sublingually so it's like five ten minutes uh and so while we go through these ideas and through our question and answer period one of the biggest things that i really wanted to be able to share tonight is i want us to be thinking about the impact that plants can have the value that plants have to give you that opportunity so that when you're walking through the forest that you can take a second uh and like don't walk through the forest. Like I know nurses like to run, walk everywhere real fast, make it hard. Kids can't keep up with you. So slow down when you're walking through the forest. Don't just walk through the forest on your path, wherever you are. Most of you from Toronto by the looks of the answer garden. So like, don't just walk just to walk, take a second, look at what's around you and see if you can measure the value of all of those plants that exist in that forest existing that are existing in that forest at that moment um and 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 to work in with the powers that we have to consult with the culture that is responsible for maintaining the knowledge that's required to be able to use those plants and live in this part of the world so with the prickly ash its ability to control pain inside of your mouth and bacteria and, and thus inflammation uh, from the bacteria. Uh, um, this one is um, super important for, and it's because it's absorbed sublingually, like you have teething babies. <sighs> like we make teething necklaces with the stems. Of course you take the tines off, but the stem is hollow. <laughs> Somebody always asks, do you take the tines off first? But the stem is always is hollow. So you could run a string through pieces of the, of the twig. And, and, uh, and when you, you hold any baby, they shove everything inside of their mouth. Uh, so if you have this necklace on, they shove it inside of their mouth and they feel that pain relief and they say, Hey, they don't say, Hey, cause they're teething when they're like four to one year, four months old to one year, whatever this is the worst. Uh, but they are able to feel that pain relief because it happens so fast because the medicine is absorbed sublingually that they already know before they could even talk that plants are medicine, that I need to remember this. I need to use this. And my daughter almost said stick before she said dad. And I had to work really hard so that didn't happen. <laughs> uh, and so this is how uh, much medicine is and always was a part of our life. We were using it before we could even speak. Uh, and so as far as impact goes, uh, I got to work with one indigenous healthcare center who just hired on a, uh, a dentist, a dental hygienist sort of dentistry team. And the dental hygienist just got wisdom teeth removed. We we're at some fall festival thing. And I had a bunch of tea. I had like 200 different plants of medicine plants splayed out for everybody to check out. And uh, I saw that woman's, the, the dental hygienist, her face was green and massive and she's drinking a smoothie all day. So I ran up to her uh, and she had no idea who I, who I was, but I had these little fruits. This is uh, from the prickly ash. And I said, put this in your mouth. And, and she was like, no. <laughs> but then everybody pressured her because everybody kind of knew my role in that health center was like, you should use this medicine. You know, he, he knows what he's talking about. This would be real cool. So she put it inside of her mouth. And in five minutes, well, five, 10 minutes or whatever, she, she ran away, walked away real fast. And then she came back with a sandwich and started eating a sandwich. Uh, and, and she was real thankful. She, she thought, you know, she, the inflammation, we watched the inflammation inside of her face for the whole afternoon just go down. Like if we had our, her on hyperlapse, uh, her, you would have saw her face shrink. And uh, it was a really amazing experience. And I left her with a jar. And she almost went eight months in that 
institution without uh without the patients needing opiates um and she used a 250 mil jar of the prickly ash uh and prevented that influx into our communities and so think of the impact then on uh on the addictions or opiate crisis that we're in 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 canada uh and in indigenous communities and think of the impact that this can have on that influx of uh pain medication and so we can be novel in the way that we're thinking about how plant medicine can be used in cleaning our lungs uh and you know our lung medicine this plant you know the roots sharing the same primary and secondary bronchial tube branching patterns as the same branching patterns as your lungs the little flowers like little empty sockets of air just like the alveoli uh and in this roots responsibility in being able to uh irritate the lining of your stomachs stimulating the vagus the vagal connection vagus nerve to your lungs to uh, secrete mucus and expectorate so to clean your lungs, um, uh, this plant has a really incredible role in keeping our lungs healthy. And again, that identity embedded in the structure of it to always be showing us, but to sort of then give us the opportunity to gesture towards the parts of your body that you kind of, you need an electron microscope to be able to see like alveoli with the blood capillaries uh, and, and, you know, all of the other medicines that when we're walking through the forest to kind of take a second look at it and say, you know, who are you? what what were you responsible for creating and how can how can you help me um and so we could see all of these different shapes and structures and that that help us understand what those connections are and validate not validate um remember help us remember the use that uh, that these that these uh, medicines have, so we have our. Uh, let me see here. One last one, and then I have another thing that I wanted to show you guys. Uh, but our liver medicine too. Um, liver. Uh, every single plant that we will call kwan uh, shkike liver medicine is going to be uh, is going to have the structures of all parts of your liver embedded into the plant, like thistles have the hexagon stem, uh, like uh, the stem that has the same sh structure as your liver lobules. Uh, the gold thread has the three big lobes. The flower has the same shape as a hexagon and the roots are bright yellow, like the like with the contents of the gallbladder uh, and, and um, other plants too will sh that share these same structures like our muscle medicine uh the muscle medicine also has a really amazing connection with the liver uh because you know if you're giving your muscles everything they need to be able to utilize glucose uh the that strain and insulin resistance in your liver is able to is able to go down resolve itself and so uh the that that taxation on your liver is removed. And so the, even though this medicine is designed the, to help your muscles, the lily pad roots uh, also have aspects of the liver incorporated into its structure too, to show you, you know, because I help the muscles, I help your liver uh, and also vice versa. Uh, so I kind of wanted to share us, with us some of these images uh, and some more colloquial ones too that we'll see on Facebook and uh, things like that. But uh, to show us these images, so that when we're outside to give us that opportunity to just think twice to take a second and say who are you <laughs> uh what is your name and and uh what are you connected to uh because you'll be able to make some really really amazing connections uh with all of these different plants uh so i wanted to be able to share that and then also too uh, real fast, I promise. Um, this medicine here, makakim uh, das, is is a is is medicine for our back. It's medicine for your back, and uh, it it does this really really well. This is one of my favorites uh, because the roots have a another saponin that's absorbed sublingually that draws all of the calcium from every sensory neuron in your spine 
So you have somebody who has sciatica, uh, the pain is gone in 15 minutes and people are able to stand straight for the first time, sometimes in almost a decade. Um, and, and so I use this with people to be able to give them the opportunity to experience how powerful medicine is and how important it is to get the knowledge that we need to go to Ontario, uh, to be able to go to Anishinaabek and say, you know, what do you have for me? Uh, um, and this is what we're capable of in accessing that knowledge and accessing that culture. Uh, and, and when we have those experiences, then we know what's out there and we are given in those, through those experiences, the knowledge and motivation that we need to do what we have to do to be able to learn on our own. Um, and so this one, yeah, uh, you know, it doesn't just help with the pain either. It, it, it inhibits the toxic effects of glucose on the sciatic nerve so that it's able to heal. There's able to, they're able to um, uh, allow for nutrient transport and the, the, some even completely severed nerves in, in mice were able to reconnect and fuse again uh, in the constant presence and constant insult of hyperglycemia that was still able to heal. And so there's a really amazing uh, process that these plants go through to be able to offer these qualities. Um, some of which have been, uh, are able to be mimicked by Western medication. Um, uh, sometimes not completely though, and certainly sometimes not at all. This is a really good example of that. Uh, but this plant has a really amazing gift to be able to offer and uh, one of the last things that I wanted to say is that it's super important for us to take a second when we're outside and stop and look, assess, identify value in all of the plants that we've spent our lives walking past, like nurse walking past, to be able to stop and say, what is out here? <laughs> and uh, um, where do I get the knowledge that I need to be able to understand these things and, and dedication to that. Uh, and, and, and so um, learning what their names are, the importance of that language, but then to also the, to learn um, uh, yeah, what their, what their gift is and where their value is and their connections are and to being able to help our bodies work properly. Um, and then the next thing that we have to do is to say, how can I help you? <laughs> Cause we can't just take and take and take, you know, we've all been in relationships where people just take, they're not even giving you nothing back, even though they have a gift, you know, they're real good bakers. They don't bring me any bread. So when you're not getting anything in a relationship, eventually somebody's going to get cut off. <laughs> And so this medicine is a really good example of how important it is to understand the, um, that we also need to be there for the plants. We need to help them. And with this one, uh, it, this one plant will make like 800 seeds every year, but it's so competitive for space. If those seeds fall within one foot of the parent plant, the parent will hormonally sterilize all of those seeds because it's competitive for space. All this has to, all that has to happen is these seeds have to land over a foot away from the parents. And so it's really easy to take the seed and, and take it to another part of the swamp and drop them there. That's 800 pitcher plant or mukakim das plants that are going to be able to grow there. Uh, and in a couple of years, we, we, you could have an entire swamp covered in this plant. Um, when you're there helping it, uh, um, it's going to be there to help you. And when you can understand that when a plant is giving you a gift, you need to give something back and spending time with the plant to be able to understand how you could give, how you can help the plant uh, and, and being responsible for that reciprocation and engaging in a reciprocal relationship with that plant and with the, with the knowledge that is responsible for remembering how to use that plant uh, is super, super important. And uh, every plant has a way that you can help it. And, um, and for the most part, it's all very easy. And so when you're 
involved in relationships with hundreds of different plants, this idea that we're never alone, uh, that we have all of these connections that are out there, and all of these potential relationships just at our footsteps uh, um, are able to uh, even further connect us and ground us to the land that we're living on, help us to become responsible for something really, really great. Uh, and in the case of a lot of these mes mes medicines, uh, species at risk, uh, that that understanding this type of knowledge is and can be responsible for the recovery of certain species and certain medicines uh and and so a lot of these ideas that that i'm sharing tonight are are super super important um and uh but in, in those few points and those few goals that we wanted to be able to accomplish with this type of webinar i hope i've provided us with the opportunity to be able to say okay super cool everything that's outside I need to learn about it <laughs> and start consulting with the uh, the the knowledges that are responsible for keeping this um, and uh, and and responsible for our learning and responsible for our lives, getting close to and living the life that this land is able to provide for us. Um, one of the things I wanted to share too, real fast, is. Uh, um one second yeah one of the things too that i wanted to share real fast and then i'll end with this and then i'll bust in a bunch of crazy questions for 20 minutes uh, as i got um the the really the epitome of medicinal knowledge is possible again <laughs> uh luckily so it could have very easily been completely removed like it was from other parts of the world, like Costa Rica. This knowledge is gone. Um, and, and it's just, it's, it's not there. It's, it's irrecoverable. Um, whereas here, it has been recoverable. And I've been really thankful to be a part of that process. And so I've been able to make a medicine, which is a reduction of all of the all of the medicinal knowledge that we have here. So to look back again at this macrocosmic level of the whole world kind of gesturing towards the Great Lakes region, the King, to access medicine and that partnership, but then also Manitoulin being that concentration of, and Wikomakong being a epicenter of knowledge and going right back to my grandma, remembering from when she, like 45 years ago, how to be able to make this medicine, uh, which is a reduction of all of the medicinal potential that we have in this entire geo region. We spend weeks harvesting it all, 119 different species of plants that we put in a giant pot and that we stir every day, even if our collarbone is broken uh, from, uh, from a grandparent's misadventure. <laughs> uh, we stir this medicine constantly. And, uh, and, and what we do is extract all of the medicinal potential and reduce it until we evaporate all of the water, until we're left with this particular pot was 160 quarts, and we reduced it down to the oils the medicinal potential of all of those different uh 119 different medicinal plants all of their medicinal potential was reduced into six quarts and this type of medicine we eat on a regular basis it's a part of our lives from beginning to end and it was the first time that my family got to experience it my grandma gave us the the tools and knowledge we needed to be able to uh, to be able to learn this, uh, we were able to make it for the first time in my family in like 45 years, the first time in my community in like over 20 years. Uh, and, and now there is a, uh, um, a really, really amazing, um, uh, awakening of medicinal knowledge in indigenous communities where we're remembering how to make this medicine again. And it's, and it's starting to become a part of us, a part of our everyday life. Like it's okay for us to do this again. And so we are. <laughs> uh, and it's really amazing just to be a part of that whole journey to find where this knowledge is and engage in it that way. So with that, I guess uh, I better uh, I better address some questions that, that everybody might have. Um, uh, I hope that 
that was able to, you know, provide us with the opportunity to be able to um, get the motivation and inspiration that we need to be able to understand that this is really important and we need to learn about it to really give us that opportunity to connect us with the land that we're living on and encourage us to spend time with the knowledge and the culture that's responsible for maintaining that knowledge that is there to give us uh, life, <laughs> all of it, all together. I hope that makes sense. Um, but yeah, how are those questions looking? Uh, <laughs> we have quite a few. So I guess we can just get started. Miigwech for the presentation, Joseph. It was so, so uh, detailed and I found it so interesting. It was uh, going back and forth between the questions and listening to you, but uh, miigwech for sharing your knowledge today. Uh, so one of the first questions we had really early on was a uh, participant asking about what is an ally. And I think this is in regards to when we were discussing self-identifying as First Nations, Métis, or Inuit, or if you consider yourself an ally. Oh, yeah. Oh, me. Oh, okay. Yeah. An ally? <laughs> A friend. <laughs> um, Perfect. Quinn, do you want to do the next question? Sure. Yeah, awesome. Great stuff, Joseph, as always. Oh, my God. I'm like, got all these questions and things are happening so quick. And it's like, whoa, so cool. It's like trying to write things down. And I'm like, whoa, you know, so oh, just <laughs> so cool. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so we got to do have a few questions. Um, th there's one question here that came up earlier on was, is there a way to make right connection and right relationship with the land as a settler? So that was a question that was posed in the chat earlier. Yeah, so I really like that question. So I think um, that, yeah, for sure. And uh, just um, kind of uh, understanding that... Uh, um, that there is a knowledge that and a uh, there is a culture that has been for thousands of years responsible for maintaining the knowledge that is required to be able to live here and to be able to engage in reciprocal relationships with hundreds of different plants to be utilized for foods and for tools and so uh the the, the that knowledge is responsible for giving us the ability to to um uh, live, uh, I guess, for maybe lack of a better term, harmoniously here, uh, to be able to give us the tools that we need to be able to always be helping the land that we're living on. And uh, um, I think it's just, you know, that answer is just embedded in education. It's just getting the knowledge that we need to be able to uh, understand these relationships, these connections, and to be able to um, uh, exercise them. Great. Awesome. Um, Rachel? Yeah, sorry, I was just copying and pasting another question. <laughs> um, so I know that you have uh, on your Facebook page, Joseph, Joseph, and your Instagram, you have lots of resources and information for individuals, but is there a list that you know of, of places where people can use or find traditional medicines? I do know that this does vary per territory, so it might be quite a large question, actually. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I really like this question. So if I could simplify that really easily, uh, and to just say that where you are going to get this kind of knowledge uh, is from grandmas, grandmas and grandpas, aunties and uncles, and from those of us who uh, have had experiences with these types of medicines within living memory uh, and remember what those experiences are, remember what those medicines are. And if, uh, if it's a, if it's a safe place to be able to, uh, engage in the sharing of that. Uh, and I just say safe place because the knowledge is there. I mean, my main job is to show a community that you guys already got it. Like 
all I had to all I have to do more often than not is is to show an indigenous community that you already have this information is, and and that it's okay for us to do this again uh, because it wasn't for so long until very recently uh, practicing medicine ha, uh, ha, uh, came with uh, consequences some pretty severe consequences and so uh, there are there is some trauma associated with and with a lot of us in in the exercising of medicinal knowledge um and and uh that re-traumatization is a is a very real possibility and to my job is to support and facilitate a space where we can understand that er, yeah everything is okay this, this is very important and we cannot forget um and then my favorite thing is to never have to go back to a community again for them to realize that everything is already here. All of these old people are speaking up now and, and yeah, I don't have to go back. So just understanding that it's there uh, and, and facilitating that conversation in a, in a safe way to be able to get the tools that we need to engage in all of these different relationships. It's going to be with grandmas and grandpas it's not going to be from a uh, physical resource that is yet. Um, but yeah, that's a good question. Yes, for sure. Awesome questions. We still have lots. Yeah. <laughs> um, so just before I move on to the next one, um, I believe we did talk about our Joseph and, and some of the organizers as we're going to be actually putting together a document and we'll be answering some of these questions and um, post session uh, will we can be sending that out to people. So if we don't get to a question that you have, there's a lot of amazing questions out there. Uh, we'll be sure to have a follow-up afterwards. So uh, to keep it moving, um, there was a question here um, that said, I would love to know about some medicinal plants that can help with GI issues such as IBS. <laughs> yeah, we talked about the sweet fern. Uh, uh, sweet fern, one of the reasons why I wanted to mention that one, all of the medicines that I mentioned tonight have a massive distribution throughout Ontario uh, and throughout the country. And so they're generally really easy uh, for us to find kind of no matter where we are and kind of Northwest Territories might be a little bit of a stretch, but a lot of them are from are, are like from everywhere and so really easy for us to find the sweet fern is one of those um and the the other thing too i guess that it could kind of tie in here is that some of these medicines uh that i spoke about tonight have a really common place like the like the sweet fern like it is really good for your intestines and most of us are we're always in constant engagement with this medicine just because of diarrhea like uh like uh um, gastrointestinal infection we get the medicine that we the, the, we're like every time we get an infection we use the sweet fern it's a very um, uh, antimicrobial in the sense that it will make h pylori heliobacter e coli and like like 20 something strains of each extremely hydrophobic so they're flushed out of the GI tract and so the the infection is removed uh, so we're always in constant engagement with this medicine but now when you use that medicine for like some really intense like inflammatory bowel disease like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease where you have autoimmune aspects incorporated into it then even that small engagement that we that we'll have in communities with people with these issues is like let's make a pot of tea let's have some tea you can see that it's medicine for your intestines we drink the tea and uh, people are out of a flare in like two days, you know, having normal BMs again. Uh, and that's because the, the, the real cause, root cause of the disease is removed. The, the uh, um, bacteria come, uh, coming out in, into the body uh, via that lack of mucin, the sealant. And, uh, and then also the accumulation of cellular sen senescence is, is encouraged to be um, consumed via autophagy. So the, the activation or development of autophagosomes throughout that tissue that are designed to be able to accumulate, uh, consume cellular senescence, the, the drivers of, of inflammation and, and uh, cytokines attracting immune system uh, attracting your immune system to that part of your body. So to be able to shut off uh, in a really novel way, 
certain autoimmune aspects. I don't know if I'm explaining that properly, but really getting at the root cause of so many issues. Um, but you know what? We engage with this on a regular basis just because it tasted like cinnamon and yeah. because when we needed uh, that, like to, for just diarrhea, something that happens all the time, we're also getting a really intense therapy. Awesome. Sweet. Okay. Wow. And great. then they are. So another person asked when we started talking about the prickly ash, if hazel wood was similar to it. And uh, then also, if I know that you talked about how the prickly ash really helps with um, like oral pain and inflammation, but does that also have effect uh, to other areas of the body, can, uh, like the neck or back as well? Yeah, that's that's a really solid that's a really solid question. Um, it it only does this to the mouth. So these these were all all of the stories that I explained, like from a scientific sense, were were uh, ver have, were researched in the field of drug discovery. They're trying to create a drug that can, if if a drug can draw calcium from every sensory neuron in the gums, that would be fantastic. Like we use opiates for that now that draws out calcium, sodium, and potassium from sensory neurons, uh, re reducing and limiting like the, the function of them as well as like this just removes the pain. So it's been in this drug discovery spotlight for oral hygiene and, and uh, pain management for so long. Um, and uh, it, it has been unsuccessful to create a profitable drug anyways. Um, and um when you apply that saponin to any other part of the body, to any other sensory neuron, does absolutely nothing. When it touches your mouth, it's like, it's done dealio. It's really, really incredible how specific and focused all of these medicines were. Uh, and, and again, just remembering, you know, the story of, you know, that's where these parts of our bodies have come from. And that memory and being able to restore normal, proper, and healthy function too. That's where those origins are. Awesome. That's so cool. Um, so, okay, we're moving on. Um, we have, this is a really cool one. How do we respect plant nation when harvesting these plants? Yeah. So again, that one is, is just time and energy. That's, uh, that's the answer to this is embedded in education. Uh, we need to be dedicating ourselves to get, getting the oodzuin that we need to be able to live bimodzuin, to be able to achieve bimodzuin. Um, and so uh, learning the, the fact that every plant has a flaw, every plant has a problem embedded into its life that only people can solve pitcher plants the medicine for your sciatica and your spine this plants waiting for like a moose knuckle to come by and accidentally hit it that's what it's waiting for we can see that and say hey i can help you i can grab you take you to the other side of the swamp and put you over there uh or bring you to a new swamp where there's none of you and introduce you there spread you around to bring you home uh and so to be to to that answer yeah is embedded in the knowledge that that we need to to be able to learn what these problems are and, and understand too like the worst thing that you could ever do to a forest is leave it alone when you leave it alone it just ends in fire it it'll it'll all disappear um our forest, Nishnabek, our land is designed to be constantly engaged with and constantly manipulated by people. It constantly exercising the knowledge that we need to live, but also that the plants need to live. And engaging in that relationship increases the diversity and potential of the environment, as well as the potential for our lives. So we just got to learn what those are and practice those. Can I ask a question? Yeah. First of all, um, um, it's just fantastic. Thank you so much. Just fantastic. That's, did your mother as a nurse um, benefit or benefit for sure? So that's not the question, but was able to practice 
any of the teachings? So my mom's role was was so I grew up with the with the language. I grew up with the the well Nishaba language, but then also with the lingo. Like my mom always explained to me what was happening uh, in sickness or injury, and um, uh, but my my mom's role uh, was I. Um, well, I guess it's important to say that I was raised uh, with our language and hunting and fishing and gardening and, and in, in engaging in cultural components in this sense. Uh, medicine wasn't a part of it, though. Like when we got sick or injured, we went to the hospital. Uh, and, but my mom, she was like on my case because I was picking plants and I was giving them to people, telling her what happens. And she was like, you don't know what you're doing you know like what every nurse has to say all day long you don't know what you're doing what are you going to do if somebody's on warfarin or metformin or coumadin or like any like what are you going to do when they're on some kind of drug you and and you hurt somebody so i had to learn what the plants were doing the physiological you know mechanisms of action so i could have that conversation with my mom and now every other healthcare professional that I come in contact with in Ontario uh, to be able to have a conversation uh, now to the point of, uh, of being able to speak in uh, pharmacology and toxicology classes in nursing programs and pharmacist programs at post-secondary institutes across the province uh, to be able to share how medicine works and how great of a partnership that this could be uh, and how the first step is getting that knowledge. <laughs> uh, so, but yeah, that, that my mom's role was like every other nurse that's out there. Hey. I um, only do that with the premier. <laughs> I don't do that with everybody. So don't worry. Awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Really, really great questions. Um, <clears throat> we have a lot of amazing questions in the chat. Uh, fortunately, we don't have enough time to hear them all. So as I mentioned earlier, and as it was mentioned earlier, we will be um, putting all of these questions together and we'll be doing a follow up and, uh, you know, post this session here, um, you know, the recordings as well. So um, th they, we will get to your questions um, and we really appreciate everybody, uh, you know, for engaging, for participating and for joining us. Um, and uh, of course, to Joseph, um, you know, for sharing your knowledge, um, your story. And, um, you know, it's just, it was really great, as well as um, all the organizers who helped to bring this, uh, bring us together here and to host this space. Uh, it's, it's, um, it was a pleasure. So, um, yeah, I guess we have to start, unfortunately, uh, we have to start doing this wrap up where, you know, we're, we're closing up. Um, you know, and I'm sure we, we, we would have had more time and maybe there'll be more sessions in the future. You know, I'm just going to toss that in there. So it's really great stuff. So Rachel, any other words? I think that you summarized everything beautifully. Miigwech, a huge miigwech to Joseph for being here and sharing your knowledge and for all the organizers and Diane for being here and Quinn for doing a great job moderating. Uh -huh, you so yeah, you, um, you can also find, uh, just, I'm going to drop it in there, um, Creators Garden on Facebook and on Instagram, um, you know, check it out. I'm um, sure you can reach out to Joseph through those pages and those outlets um, to continue these conversations. Um, but yeah, uh, really, it was really great to have everybody here today. So um, we're going to begin wrapping up. So I'll be looking to our organizers to see if they have any other closing remarks as we kind of begin to wrap up. Well, thank you very much, Joseph, for that amazing sharing of your family story and at the depth of the medicine knowledge that you have. And to Quinn and Rachel, you've done a great job throughout the entire webinar. Thank you very much for moderating Q&A and for setting the context. You're amazing, inspirational <laughs> Indigenous youth. I'd also like to thank the, the planning committee. Um, most of who are on this uh, screen today. So I'd like to acknowledge Marilee Naugizhuk, who is uh, one of the planning committee members, as well as a representative Samsina. So Marilee, if you wanna raise your hand, excellent. May Kat, who is a nurse practitioner and she represents Nan, so thank you. And then do we also have Lauren 
on the line, Lauren King. Well, Lauren King, she's a representative of NIN and she's also on the planning committee. We also have Bernadette de Gonzague and she's a representative of the Chiefs of Ontario. And then also like to give a special acknowledgement, acknowledgement to Lance Kobigong, as well as Winter Liscombe. They are the representatives of the Ontario First Nation Young People's Council, and they have helped organize this wonderful webinar for today. And then I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Doris Greenspun. Thank you very much for attending and for sending our greetings. We also have planning committee member and also the individual who is gonna be closing this uh, webinar for today. today. So it's Gahan Dagos, also Diane Longboat. Thank you very much for your opening as well as closing remarks to come. So just to let you know is that we do have an email that we will send and that will give you information in regard to the evaluation survey. Us as the planning committee, planning committee members, oh, we do look at those evaluation results as a way to be able to inform our future webinars, as Quinn was saying, and hopefully perhaps another webinar with Joseph. And also when you fill out the evaluation, <laughs> Doris is saying yes. We vote for that, we vote for that. <laughs> okay. Okay, and then we also, <laughs> and I know Marilee seconds that as well. Uh, you can also access uh, your certificate of attendance after you fill out that evaluation survey. Also, we realize that it's a very difficult time for everyone, so we will send you a link to the mental health resources that we also have posted on the Arneo website. And we'd like to thank you, all of the participants, for attending today. Um, it's an honor to have you all here and to have you share in our learning together. So without further ado, I'm going to send it off with Gahan de West, uh, Diane Longboat, to close. Thank you. Miigwech. Thank you so much, Grace. Well, I think you've said it all, Grace. It's just an amazing opportunity for us to um, get together to talk about these issues of culture, relationship, reciprocity, how we can build bridges between uh, Western medicine and traditional medicine knowledge, how these young people are standing in their own medicine, each of them, um, such powerful young leaders coming up. I'm so proud of them. And for all of uh, all the planning committee that had such confidence in this webinar and in these ideas that they, they jumped at creating a platform for these discussions to happen. So thank you to all the planning committee members. And uh, I'll just say a few words of closing just to, um, to let us go this evening knowing that um, we'll, we will be well and at peace. For such a beautiful day, for the opportunity to be together again, for the knowledge that's been held by Ongwehongwe and Anishinaabe people for millions of years, for the understanding of creation and our duties and our responsibilities in creation, and how today is really the unfolding of prophecy where we sit together as many nations of different people coming together to learn together in a spirit of honor and respect to share what we know and for all nations to benefit from what we know. We give thanks this day for all of the healthcare workers in our systems, in the medical system that have been working tirelessly, every single one in every hospital, every field hospital, every long-term care facility, every mental health facility, all of the service providers in our province who have struggled to keep going. We ask you this day, Creator, to wrap your arms around them and their families and all of the people who are unwell and are suffering, all of the people who have lost loved ones during this time and lift them up and give them that comfort and that energy and that strength that they need. We ask you to watch over all the people here who are on this planning committee for the good hearts and, and the good minds that they have to be able to do this work and to reach out to thousands of people with these messages. Thank you for all that you have given to us this day, the food, the water, the medicines, the air that we breathe, the homes that we live in the access to our partners, our children, our families, even if it is just through Zoom and virtual 
connection, but we are still understanding that we are loved and that we are cared for. And I give thanks this day for all the medicine words that have been shared here today. May the strength of this ceremony of teaching reach many thousands of people and be a milestone in their own development and learning. So with these words, we give thanks this day and say nyawa. Miigwech. Miigwech, dear relatives. Miigwech, Diane. And thank you, everyone. And on behalf of myself, the planning committee, everyone here, and especially Tanya, who had coordinated this webinar, I'd like to thank everyone and to wish everyone a beautiful night. Yes, Joseph. <laughs> Take care, everyone. And, and two things, oh. in addition to Joseph, in addition to Joseph, was a beautiful day today, Anise, because this government is doing sick days. Then they're on their knees with sick days. We are going to get more, 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 more. Don't give up ever. And second, George Floyd got justice. He's watching for us. Yeah, yeah. On the three counts. Murder, 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 and murder it was. So it's a good day. There is hope, as Diane says, there is hope on humanity. Wonderful. Thank you, Doris. And make wish everyone and have a beautiful evening. Bye-bye. How is my guru? Oh, my guru left. I need to call her. I'm calling it. Oh, you're there. I'm calling it. <laughs>